I see a number of relatives of my husband's and I see my friend Karen and I see Amelia and others. So thank you very much for those who have joined us online. We're very grateful. All right, I'm gonna start with a bit of prayer. Blessed be the God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation. He comforts us in all our sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. Now I'd ask you to stand as you're able for our first song that we're going to have, which is a favorite of all of ours, and that's Morning Has Broken. Please join us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our mother and sister, Edith. We thank you for giving her to us to know and love as a comforter and companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us your aid so that we may see in death the gate to eternal life, that we may continue our course on earth in confidence until, by your call, we are reunited with those who have gone before us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I'd like to invite up my son, actually, but no. Yes, Adam Scarelli is going to say a reading. We actually did this at his dad's, my husband's funeral a few years ago, and that'll be, he'll be followed by Becky. Revelations 21, 2 through 7. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Good morning. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am going, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going, Thomas said to him. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thank you guys, that's great, appreciate it. And now we'd like to move into a couple of speeches to share stories. And I'd like to start off with my wonderful nephew, who has done all of this technology and the beautiful bulletin as well, with the help of my beautiful niece, uh, Becky. Um, but Tim would like to say a couple of words, followed by my brother and then also my niece. Good morning. Over the last multiple years, I've probably gone through my head many, many times about when grandma passes, how exactly I would want to do this, because I always knew that I would speak at a funeral. And of course, my idea kept changing, because who did grandma mean? What, what exactly was it about grandma that meant something to me at the time? Because there were so many. And I'm sure everybody in this room has a word or a phrase or a sentence or a story that they can tell about grandma. And all of them could very well be different because she did so many things. My parents were very young when I was born, so Grandma wasn't just some ancillary member of my life. She was very, very involved. And there's many people I know in this room that can tell exactly the same story because she didn't just take care of her four children. She took care of so many of her siblings and her nieces and her nephews and all the foster children over the years, over, I think, of her count, over 100? Well, yeah, 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 that's a lot of people. 
lot of lives that were affected. And everybody can think of words that mean something to them. It might be disciplinarian. It could be loving to me. The word I think that means the most to me is entertainer. Grandma was an entertainer. From the Halloween parties to the extrubriant, that's a new word I just made up, <laughs> Christmas decorations. You know, you'd walk in and everything, the giant bells and the lights and the sound, it meant everything to her. She wanted everybody to be together. She loved family so dearly. And family to her didn't just mean her kids. Family to her meant everybody because she came from a large family. But entertainer as well, she was one of my biggest supporters in my furways into theater. She would be, all my fellow actors would be so excited when they found out that she was in the audience because she would drive everybody to laugh. Even if you're doing a drama, <laughs> if you do Shakespeare, like the most thing is like, she'd be laughing because be, she would see the most minute little things in my face. And she would start laughing, and I didn't intend for it to be funny, but you know what? It's fine, it was experience. And she always found a way for us all to laugh and smile. And so, to all of us here, I want everybody here to think for those moments, what makes you smile? What did she do to you to make you smile? And we're celebrating her, we're not mourning her, we're celebrating her. She was a life well lived, 92 years. I will always miss her, but I will always love her in here. And I know all of us will too. Thank you. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I got all this, but I can't see it anyways. I got these and they'll help. But no, I. Lots well, changed since the last time I had to cut up here and do this. Um, an enemy suit, a larger size, <laughs> but still the same size I had when I was 13 years old. <laughs> All of you can't say that. Yet. <laughs> my first memory of my mom was I'd have afternoon naps and I'd wake up and that my eyes would be opening. I can't see a thing with these. Um, yeah. Anyways, she'd be standing there waiting for me. And so as my eyes would open, I'd see her smile getting bigger and bigger. And she just couldn't wait till they'd be wide open so she'd give me a kiss. And people that have enjoyed her kiss, it's not just a kiss. Mm -hmm. She gets a hold of you. <laughs> like you can't pull away. And then like it would finish off with the sniffs. It was wonderful. But a lot of people here have had that pleasure. <sighs> anyway, so um, I've been referred to as her favorite child. There's just a little bit of misunderstanding there. I just got most of her attention. <laughs> I was always in trouble. Sometimes I couldn't believe it. I remember one time as early in the morning, they're still in bed. And she's telling me to come over and get my bum spent. <laughs> You know, like she's, if, I, if you don't come here, you're going to only get regret it. You know, it's going to get worse, and I can't think how it could be any worse. So, of course, I, I would do, I would go. She was, a, she was tough. Like, yeah, there's no doubt she was the toughest woman in this world. Um, she made us tough. You know, so, even when she gave first aid to us, like I used to get a lot of slivers as I like playing with wood even as a kid. And so when you'd go to her, She'd get out the little tin with the needle. She'd get on her glasses and she would look at it. And then suddenly she'd grab a hold of it, pull it towards her, wedge her elbow into her thigh. Like this is, I've seen the same thing with blacksmiths with eating new horses. <laughs> like you can't pull away, she's got you. So, but she'd get it. It would feel some relief. Even one time I had a thorn in my arm. I remember going to her, it was going to be a mistake, but they kept asking her, take me to the hospital, let them get it out. She says, if you go to the hospital, they're going to cut a big X in your arm, and you're going to have that forever. 
All right. And then uh, while I'm crying, she says, cry, I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> I said, I think the thorn qualifies or something. <laughs> Summers at the farm, as Tim said, like, it was wonderful. Like, it would start off the last day of school. She'd have you set up the tent. You'd put on your bathing suit. And you wouldn't see her until suddenly she'd call you in for the bath, knowing the next day's school. <laughs> and it was great. There'd be 20 of us at least, like including Tim, the neighbor up the road. There just wasn't enough for her. Not, there was no challenge. Dinners were fun. <laughs> they were different. Like, especially on Pancake Tuesday, she'd come out with the platter of pancakes. And there she would stand, just like a blackjack dealer, dealing them all out to you. <laughs> and you catch it, like, no five-second rule here, you just get it, right? You weren't finished until you licked your plate. That was with mom. That way it'd be easier for her to do the dishes. Other roles that she took on, she was not just a mother to us, you know, first aid treatment, blacksmith. Um, <laughs> hockey coach, she would help us, always getting you dressed for the hockey, taking you there, do that. She'd make you sit every night, practice your guitar lessons, even though I still sucked. <laughs> Cup badges. She'd make sure you got all your badges. You'd come home, it'd be done, the assignment. Yep. School assignments. One time, I, I, you may not believe this, but I wasn't doing very well in school. <laughs> <laughs> so she took it upon herself to help me on an assignment. It was grade five. And anyways, I came back. She was excited to see it, and it was an E. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she had me back in that van. We were back to the school within 10 minutes. I watched her storm in. She came out with that book in her hand, and I got an A. <laughs> and I said to her, what did you do? Wrap her by the hair? <laughs> she said, no, I didn't have to do that. She's, I just had to convince her there'd be consequences if she failed you. I'm like, what? She'll have you again next year. <laughs> Again, she always had her back. As Tim mentioned, I might as well skip this line. She loved to entertain. Like it, she, not for her enjoyment, but like she just loved people smiling. She it made her day. And it, it wasn't hard for her. Like she'd always just go, wherever there was a reunion or something, mom would show up and it would just go smoothly. It, would, it just did. Even when I was building houses, she would show up and suddenly the day would be easy. So all stress would go away with me when she would show up. Oh, yeah. So and then one day, I remember she uh, told me it's time for me to leave the house. She said to me, you're 19 years old. It's pathetic that you're still home. <laughs> right. So, okay, well, I guess so. Uh, she bought me a car so I could go. <laughs> I gave it back to her, though as I didn't need it anymore after I lost my license. <laughs> but she would call me on rainy days before that would happen. She knowing I'm not at work that day. If it's a rainy day, I'd be home. She would call me up and ask me to come home, spend the day with her. Um, so yeah, no, I'm not going to miss out on this opportunity to spend the afternoon with my mom. We'd have coffee. She'd make me breakfast. We even had a special day name for that day. It's called laundry day. <laughs> She'd always be there to help those who needed help. She didn't care, like all of, anybody. If they needed her help, she'd help. Not just with painting your house, cleaning your house. She'd help you financially. She'd help. Didn't matter if the person ever paid her back, she would still help them. That person was me. <laughs> Later in life, I moved back home as do a lot of 40-year-old men. <laughs> so, and I had that same look in the mornings when I got the eyes would open, there would be her smile again, waiting for me, just open up so she could give me a kiss. And it was great. I knew this day was going to come when I'd lose my mentor. But the, harder, the hardest day was when I had to take her to a home. She cried. I'd never seen her cry. I had to leave a few times that day. She needed running shoes, so I'd go out and get her running shoes, have a drink, come back, go get her some Nicorettes, have a drink, come back. 
But by the end of the day, she wasn't crying anymore. She realized she served a purpose. There were people worse off than her, and she was making friends. It was so nice to see. A couple of weeks went by, she let me know, I, I belong here. Everything's good. It made me feel good. Oh, man, that's when I apologized to her. I remember saying I'm sorry, and she's for what? I would say it nicely, for being a bad kid. She said, you were bad. You're confused. I thought, wow, this dementia thing's going to work out for me. <laughs> <laughs> but not long after she got sick, and a virus, a virus broke out. She, I guess, didn't get the treatment she might have, uh, anyways. But she was, it enhanced her symptoms, you know, her condition. And then she started chattering a lot. It was Marilyn. Marilyn. I go and visit. Hey, Mom, how you doing? Oh, Marilyn. Marilyn, Marilyn, Marilyn. No, Mom, it's Glenn. Where's that stupid Glenn? So stupid. I'm looking at the nurse and I said, I think my mom's ready to come home. But you gotta love this one. She never lost her physical strength. She's, again, not just the toughest, but the strongest woman out there. And one day I watched her and she took another resident's bib. And that person never really made any expressions, but that day he grabbed it. So, no, that's my bib. And there's my mom pulling and he's looking at her and his teeth are like this. <laughs> and like with all his energy, he's pulling and my mom's just, oh yeah? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And she pulled him right out of his chair. It took two of us to pry it out of her hand. Um, again, I'm going to go back to something Tim said here, like about the farm. Like, I wasn't, the, I was there, but I don't remember when we moved into the farm. But I've seen pictures of the first couple of days, and it was pretty rough. But I could see my mom's face in the pictures, and she knew this was where she was going to raise her family. This is going to be our home. But not just home to us, but to everyone. Like this home was a sanctuary. This home, a refuge for some. But this home brought a lot of joy. And then I realized it wasn't the farm that we all when we refer to it that we love. It was our mom. Thank you. Seeing all of you here kind of reminds me of when Grandpa died, and then all the parties, like, it was the parties that I remember growing up, seeing everyone as a family, and then when uh, Grandma got Alzheimer's, dementia, and the parties stopped, when times got a little rough, I always felt like people are growing up, and I'm feeling like I'm still stuck in... 1985. <laughs> Grandma, she was a strong woman. She was pretty much my inspiration for a lot of things. Sure, as a kid, I pretty much was not focused on a lot of things, but the older I got, the more I realized, yeah, she inspired me to do a lot of things. She inspired me to sew, and yeah, if I try to hold up a finished dress, it's going to fall apart. But hey, I'm still learning. She, like Uncle Glenn said, would always give you these, you know, these big kisses. And I'm like, I was a kid. I felt my hand being grabbed and hurts <laughs> eating my cheek. And I'm like, oh my gosh, am I going to be devoured? <laughs> she always did her best to keep everyone together as a unit, as a family. And even in death, here we are, our friends, families extended relatives, foster relatives. Grandma made a community, she made a home, she made a place for everyone to come together, to feel safe, to feel loved, to feel like what a family should feel. That was my grandma. Edith Salmon, <laughs> she, she was the strongest woman I've ever known. She's stronger than Popeye the Sailor Man, I can bet that. She could like tug a yacht with just one arm, I bet. You don't need no spinach for that woman. Her strength was love. 
Her strength was the fact that she loved everyone. She loved everyone unconventionally. She had favorites. She had many stories of who was her favorite, who was definitely someone she liked to give attention to, either between my dad and my Uncle Glenn. But uh, she definitely also had favorite grandkids, and I always loved spending Sundays with her and Grandpa in Orangeville. Those were the best days ever. Every Sunday I would get excited just to go have dinner with them, Mom, Dad, Grandma, and Grandpa. Sure, yeah, I would spend a lot of time with Grandpa. I loved to go on walks with him, but I also loved getting those hugs from Grandma and just hearing stories. Even though she has left us now physically, she's not gone spiritually. She's not gone from our memories or our hearts. And that's all I know. So, love you, Grandma. Thank you to all. Um, at this time, we just want to invite if anybody else had anything that they want to say about mom, you're welcome to. It was really a, a tough act to follow. I mean, the love that that woman expressed everyone. She touched everybody's love. So, <sighs> this is weird. Uh, anyways, I found a, a passage called the family tree, which exemplified what Edith means to me. I'll try to read it. It said, a limb has fallen from the family tree. I hear a voice that whispers, grieve not for me. Remember the best times, the laughter, the song, the good I lived while I was strong. Continue my heritage, I'm counting on you. Keep on smiling. The sun will shine through. My mind is at ease. My soul is at rest. Remembering all how I was truly blessed. Continue traditions, no matter how small. Go on with your lives. Don't stare at the wall. I miss you all dearly, so keep up your chin. Until that fine day, we're together again. Hi, I'm Nathaniel. I'm the uh, great grandson of Edith, or great grandmother. Um, I just want to say a few words, keeping this short. So it's only you, she's a mom, a grandma, or even great grandmother. And to all of us, she was family. Uh, I remember days where we go to grandmother or grandmother's for dinner or lunch or whatever we did, and she would be there. Sometimes it was a birthday, sometimes it was a celebration or something, who knows. But grandma, great grandma would be there, and as many of you have said already in your speeches, she would give you that devouring kiss where she would suck your cheek off. <laughs> and it was, I miss it, I'll be honest. I didn't see grandma much in the last few years, and I kind of regret it. I couldn't handle the old age home, but I know that a lot of you still went, and a lot of you still respected her and spent time with her, and I'm thankful for that, that she had people in her life. And she built a loving community, a loving family, and she built a home for all of us. Thank you. Thank you to everybody that have, um, has come up here. My gosh, just such warm and wonderful words from grandsons, great grandsons. Oh my gosh, just and son. Way to go, guy. I got to follow you to come up. Anyways, <laughs> thank you again, everybody, for. Um, for your words, that's wonderful. Now I'm just gonna ask everybody uh, if they'd stand. We're gonna sing the next song, and then after sit down, because I forgot to tell you about last time. <laughs> and there's the second. Please be seated. 
So I, I did this eulogy without checking with my brother or my nephew or anybody else on what they were saying. So there may be some duplication here, um, but we'll, I'll try and remember to skip over that. But again, I just want to again thank everybody for coming. Edith Marie Salmon was a name that many know, recognize, and I would bet bring a fun or at least a memorable event. Our mother was a dutiful daughter, devoted wife and mother, loving grandmother, great-grandmother, supportive sister, aunt, niece, good friend, and all we've heard with a smile for everyone. She was born on a farm in Saskatchewan in 1932 during the Depression, the oldest of 18 children. Think that. Who would think that that role of being the eldest would prepare her for the future as a foster mom? She was her dad's right-hand person, helping him out on the farm, but also doing double duty by helping her mom inside. She left school at the age, um, I'm sorry, in grade eight, to be able to go home and um, help them because there were so many children coming along. She loved music, especially country and Irish music, listening to Johnny Cash and Stompin' Tom and Lord of the Dance. She loved Lord of the Dance music, just like <laughs> you. And she was a problem solver. She was our problem solver of our family. She was able to figure out what to do next, you know, if finances were getting low. And that's where she stumbled onto fostering. What a great idea. You know, we can look after kids. They're going to melt in with my kids. I'm used to it. And you can get paid for it, too, on the side. But anyways, it was a camp, more so for most of the, the, our family, with all those children there, there was always somebody to play with, somebody to boss around, somebody to do whatever you had to do. But it also meant that Debbie and I, being the oldest of anywhere between 10 to 12 kids in total, were making beds, um, making dinner. I hate to this day scraping uh, potatoes. I will not eat potatoes <laughs> because we had to do a 10 pound bag every night to feed everybody, because it wasn't just the kids that were there. My grandfather, my grandmother sometimes, my great aunt Elsie and her husband Tom, there was always like 17 or more people there um, to be fed and stuff. But it was always made for stories, etc. And I wish I'd paid a lot more attention to them, I have to admit, especially when they were talking about their days when they were young. But we were always well fed, some to our detriment, Clean clothes, raised to be respectful of others, and honestly, all due to mom. Because of discipline. We kind of alluded to that a little while ago, but she did. She ruled as a sergeant major, but she had to, and I suspect she was raised that way um, as well. We had a paddling board in her obituary. It mentions this little board like this that fit in a hand. And it had a picture of a deer and a bear. And it said for the cute little deer with the bear behind. I was getting to that. So now I remember getting it once. And it was well deserved. Uh, I remember it well. Um, but I know some others who wore the pictures off the board um, with their back ends. And even a couple of wooden spoons, if I remember right. We were always getting wooden spoons. So I have so many fond interactions with mom. But let me tell you, if you're young and you got sassy, as Glenn mentioned as well, did something to her dislike, you could not outrun her. She was fast. She used to chase down rabbits as a child for her father so they'd have food in the table. She could outrun anybody. And I'm telling you the stories, it was better you did not try because if you did and she caught you, it was much worse. So as he <laughs> said, come here, Glenn. Okay, might as well, because it was, it was going to be worse. And then she could backhand you into next Thursday. So. We have so many fond, actually, uh, memories, though, honestly, of mom, because when, um, as we grew, she had a tendency, it seemed, to grow kids. Whenever my husband and I would show up, you'd turn into the yard, and there was this side yard that had apple trees, and there was a kid growing under every tree. And I thought, wow, that's kind of neat. But if they were disciplined, that's, there was just so many of them, they all had to go and sit under a tree. Go sit under your tree. And they did it, because they knew if they did, they would be in trouble. But as soon as we got there, she would relent and Nick would start a baseball game or something with them and Mom and I could go in and talk. But um, she was just really good at keeping control of things. As we got older, Mom and I got closer. I think we all did as we got older. But uh, we loved doing activities together. My sister was telling me a story when she was there. Mom was the best at wallpaper. We had every room wallpaper, let me tell you, but it was perfect. 
Anyways, um, and so Debbie said uh, she was going upstairs with Mom one day, and they said something silly, and they both started laughing. And they laughed, and they laughed, and they sat down, and they were rolling. They, uh, they just couldn't get to the wallpaper on time, as it turned out. But that was the way it was with Mom. Um, Mom and I went out, I remember going out to Wayne's wedding, my uncle, and I think he's online, and then in 1976, so we took a train ride, uh, sorry, a plane ride together, and it was one of our first times together, um, and we spent three days, and it was wonderful. We were on the plane, we could have a drink together. Oh, I was 19, so it was all kind of good for me. Um, we could have a smoke, you could smoke back then. Um, and we spent three days um, out there having a lot of fun and just bonding together, sharing the motel room, et cetera, helping to serve the food. Um, and I have to say that was probably the most bonding moment that I had, where I went from being a kid to being an adult with my mom. Parties, we talked about her parties. She loved parties. As somebody here, I'm sure everybody here that has had an opportunity it's at, to join one of those parties because they were amazing. I don't know if you've heard about her Halloween parties. She would make costumes that were you buy in the store. Uh, they were just absolutely amazing. One day I went to a party with my good friend Mary who was coming down with me. We were going down the stairs and it was a Halloween one and there was a coffin in the middle there and there was a mummy wrapped in it and everybody's around talking and as we're going down the mummy sat up. Oh, my MG. Mary, I thought she was going through the concrete wall. I mean, she was just terrified. Mom just loved to scare people as well, but also um, just make everybody else laugh at our panic that we were going through. She was a planner and um, organizer extraordinaire, and I figured that's where I get my project management skills from. Dad was not so much the planner, but he went along with everything she said. And they, it just worked really well for them. Whatever she didn't have, she was more the disciplinarian than him honestly. Um, he had, you know, the calmness type of thing at one point that could just kind of, it just worked. It just worked so well for the two of them. So parties were fun, but Christmas was the best. I mean, you, that tree was overflowing and you'd go down and there'd be 12 of us kids, but I, there'd so many uh, presents, but she wrapped everything, socks, underwear, um, batteries, so you learn to <laughs> take the new, the littlest one and open it first because it's not true that the you know, nice things come in little things. It's just batteries. So, but she wrapped everything, and it always had to be different um, colors of paper. You couldn't have the same paper for the child um, more than one gift. So she had lots of wrapping paper, and you got a plethora of beautiful presents. And she always, she taught me to make sure that the outside of a present is just as good. You need to make it just as good as what's inside the present. I know that she loved parties because we had a 50th anniversary party for her in 2004 in Orangeville. And you know what? Um, she'd never had a reception. They, I know that they married at Peoples Church in Toronto. And then they um, went to a little a restaurant, from what I understand, for a sandwich for those who were in attendance because that's all they could afford. So the rest of us, we, sister, brothers, we put on a 50th anniversary party for her. and. I know that when she walked in, her face, the picture on her face made it so worth it. And she talked about that party for weeks, weeks. And so I made her this big scrapbook with everybody's picture and everything that we had taken. And she went through that all the time and she just loved it. So we would get together, as um, Glenn and Tim had said, with people, we'd have dinners I mean, there was always somebody at our place. You were never bored, and if you were, you were had sent to do the dishes. So, <laughs> or peel potatoes. Oh. Anyways, um, we're, there was always somebody there, so we'd have Kentucky Fried Chicken on a Sunday night, or we'd order in pizzas or something like that. It was something always to look forward to. So if Nick said to me, what are we having for dinner? I said, let's go to Mom's. Didn't have to cook. But the biggest celebration were two reunions that they had in 1981, and Mom pretty much planned it all. So one on the Bennett side of the family, and one a few weeks later on the Salmon side of the family. And in total, between these two reunions, there was over 300 people that came. So there was tents everywhere. It's a good thing we lived on the farm. We had this open field, and uh, we had one bathroom in the house. I think she got a couple of porta potties because we were certainly going to need it. But everybody talked about that those reunions so long after that I even heard people talking about it this week, as a matter of fact. That was truly a wonderful event where people from all across Canada and even from the U.S. came to visit uh, for those reunions, and I remember that. 
Mom loved family and friends, as we've talked about, and um, bringing people together. And that's what we're supposed to do, right? We are all been born with talents and skills and given gifts that we're supposed to share. And that's what she did. She shared everything just as God tells us to do. Because if we weren't needed, I know we would not be here um, on this earth. So she made a contribution with her life and we want me to do the same thing. And I'm try striving to do that going forward to make sure, hey, what would mom do in this case? Or what my husband as well, what would they do? And that's gonna hopefully make me a better person so the reunions, as I said, were talked about forever, but if you can imagine, the biggest union right now is happening in heaven. Just imagine she's, got, she's with her parents, she's with um, her husband, my dad, she's with her sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, friends, all those people that have left before us, they are all together. They're there praising God, honoring Jesus for his sacrifice, and hugging and laughing. She has a renewed body and a renewed mind. You have to understand that for the last six years, she was in a wheelchair with dementia, you know, and yes, she knew me. She loved me. Um, she knew Marilyn, but then everybody is called Marilyn. Fairness, Glenn was called Marilyn, so I can't do this. But, um, but it, when I, she saw me, she would cry. Um, and I knew that she still knew me. Uh, boy, talking about guilt, you know, and leave telling you, but so I just celebrate. We are celebrating here today, Mom's life, we're celebrating that she's free, that she is um, running around again, chasing rabbits up in heaven. And, you know, one day we will be there too, praising God and thanking and seeing her again. And you know what? It's going to be the best reunion of all. Amen. Now, if you could join me um, in saying the Lord's Prayer, there's no need to stand, but I'd like to take a moment and recognize that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But for thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now I'd like to ask my brothers and my sister to come forward as we commend Mom's spirit to God. Let us commend our mother, Edith Marie Salmon, to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Edith. Acknowledge, humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in life. Amen. <coughs> I'm going to close with the word of prayer and then our final song. Um, this song that we're going to sing is indeed her favorite. Whether we get through it, I don't know. Um, but anyways, be prepared. But please do uh, stand and join me in this final prayer. Thank you, Father, for all you have blessed and provided us with. We rejoice to know that there is life after death through your son, Jesus. Take us safely home from here and guide us each every day until we too see your glory. In the name of your Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing. If we never meet again this side of heaven And as we struggle through this world and its strife There's another meaning there's something in heaven By the beauty
I want to thank everybody online for attending today. This is the end of the service. The rest of the ceremony will be in tournament, and unfortunately, we won't have the camera right there. But uh, but we really appreciate you being involved. Thank you so much.